all together and well done. Um, I'm going to to talk. We should be up here by 11, 11.30. <laughs> uh, I don't want to take a bunch of time. And my job is to talk here for a bit. And I guess your job is to listen. But if you get finished before I do, then just <laughs> don't have time, time to stop. Um, but please make any comments. Or, or I'm going to be giving you a lot of my um, some of my experience, some of my ideas. I'm impressed with what I've heard about, about the Niagara Alzheimer's Society and what you've done. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about public, what's happening in the public sector, what's happening with, with the care partners, with the actual care partner and the person with dementia. And then I wanted to also put in a little bit about so maybe some connections that might be helpful or, or, or might, um, might have some useful input. I don't know if that's one of your relatives or not, <laughs> but for sure the next guy is one of all of ours. And he's for a, a term of, of reference, a frame of reference. Because in the Stone Age, we seem to do a lot of things well that we aren't doing as much now. In the Stone Age, we functioned in packs, we functioned in groups, because we wouldn't have survived otherwise. We knew that social support was essential to survival. Um, today's research has, has shown us how we know that death rates are very much linked if you have low social support, or you feel you're not giving good support to, to someone or the community, death rates tend to be higher. If you don't feel you're, you're useful in some way, then we know that disability goes up, death rates go up. And for women especially, if you don't perceive, if we don't perceive that we're getting and giving good support, we tend to have higher death rates. <coughs> and especially as we age, social support is linked to markers of inflammation and, and keeping up our, our barriers so that we're able to, to continue to cope well. <coughs> Coping can be more challenging as, as we age. But in the Stone Age, certainly, they knew about social support working together. And their stress levels were more manageable, even though they were fighting saber-toothed tigers and beating off and roving uh, cavemen, their stress levels went high, but then they fell. Our stress levels go up. Our tigers and, and enemies come in the form of, of disease or telephone calls or visits to, to doctors or lawyers or whoever. And our levels don't ever fall, because then they just go right back up again. And that's why stress today has become such a, a major player in, in health and in illness. So, <coughs> just a, a, a brief review of some, of some facts about where, where we are today. We live a lot longer, but we've got new problems. And of course, the big one is, uh, is Alzheimer's. It's now the sixth leading cause of death in um, developed countries. And we know in Canada, we are going to have um, 1. million more people with dementia. And we also know, though, that we have um, power now. We are able to not only live longer, but we vote. And we know that society, even though society is trying to keep up with the uh, care for Alzheimer's, it's still us, it's still the care partner, it's still the family that provides most of the care. The system only provides about 20% right now. So. I wanted to talk about a few of the public demands, a few of the, the issues we're facing now, and, and then move on from that. So, 
<coughs> what are some of the issues we're facing in the public sector? The first one is the medical care system. I want to read something by a, a brilliant physician named Atul Gawande, who's just published his latest book called Being Mortal. And this is what he says. He says, we've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival, but really it is larger than that. It is to enable well-being. And well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of life or when disability comes, but all along the way. Whenever serious sickness or injury strikes and your mind or your body breaks down, the vital questions are the same. What is your understanding of the situation and its potential outcomes? What are your fears and what are your hopes? What are the trade-offs you are willing to make and not willing to make? And what is the best course of action that serves this understanding? That's what the job of medicine is today. I remember when I would be doing a lot of teaching with young um, nurses and physicians, and I'd say, what is it that medicine cures? And they think, and they think. I remember one nurse saying, um, I'm leprosy. She rose and raised her hand. But we don't so much cure. We have more of a cure for some time. But we do manage. But it turns out that well-being and, and coping are the big things. The second point I wanted to make is that government, and we've heard about the money that, that's coming and that the LIMS are doing, and Ontario does have these offers coming up that will be useful about bundling care, giving care partners much more choice in, in, in their choice of, of um, who's going to provide the care, and, and more support for caregivers. But you know what? This is only going to work if all the people connected are really willing to talk to each other, to talk, to listen, to share, and to be open about what their needs are. And then the next point I want to mention is that we still have a lot of public reticence about dementia. And it makes me think back of how it used to be when I was just starting out a thousand years ago about cancer, which is my, my main field of research. Um, way back Oh, I don't know, in the 19, um, let's say, you know, a couple of years ago, <laughs> was a, a woman with breast cancer, and she lived in New York City, and she wanted to start a group. She just felt alone. She had breast cancer. She'd been diagnosed. She needed someone to talk to. So she went to someone who was actually one of my mentors and said she had an idea about starting a group. And my mentor, Dr. Jimmy Holland, said, great idea, go for it. So she went to the New York Times and to the editor and said, I'd like to put in a little local announcement about people wanting to come who had breast cancer so we can share our experiences. And the editor said, great idea. There's just a couple of problems. We don't use the word cancer, and we don't use the word breast. He said, you could ask for people who had diseases of the chest wall, perhaps, <laughs> to come and talk. So this woman went home, and instead she founded Reach to Recovery, which some of you may be familiar with, which um, that wasn't all that long ago. And we have that reticence still with dementia and Alzheimer's. And until we are so open about talking about it, and asking questions about it and sharing our feelings, that public, that reticence is going to hold us, hold us back. The reason that breast cancer has done so well is that the breast cancer society or population of women learn from the AIDS um, community. Remember when AIDS first came out? People with AIDS, remember they, they stormed the, the presidents of drug companies and they they marched up to their legislators 
and they demanded that someone pay attention, that this was a, a crisis. And the leaders in breast cancer followed that, that same model, and they marched, and they spoke, and they demanded, and they made nuisances of themselves, and we've come a long way in breast cancer today. We've come a long way in AIDS today. And it comes by not having that, that public reticence, by being a little more open, a little more vocal, a little more demanding. And that's something that I think we're still going to be, be dealing with. And certainly, we're going to have to push to get a lot more money for Alzheimer's. The World Health calls it a, a tidal wave, an epidemic. Uh, as, tsunami that's coming to, to our world. And the United States provides now about mm, almost six billion dollars on uh, cancer care, six billion. They give about three <coughs> billion to AIDS. And right now they're giving about a half a billion to Alzheimer's. And in Canada, we, my last numbers, we the government has given about $250 million to AIDS and to Alzheimer's research. So we have to do a little more advocating, talking, screaming, yelling, writing, all of those things. We have to learn from those um, white who went before us. Because Alzheimer's is the defining disorder or disease of our generation. And of course, the pace of change. I mean, change takes a long time. We can start today to advocate, and it's going to take a while. Um, I always think about how slow change can take in medicine, and yet how fast it can be in one sector and how slow in another. You know that the, the I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you don't actually, but a long time ago, for breast cancer, the, the cure was a Halsted radical mastectomy, where the doctors took out everything, muscles and glands and everything. And that technique was discovered in about 1898. And by 1914, they knew you got no better results from that horribly disfiguring surgery than you did from much less radical surgery. Yet the Halstead mastectomy went on until the 40s, into the 50s. Um, so having the knowledge and putting it into practice can take a long time. When today we have technology and many things, but we're not making use of it because of the emotional and the human and the psychological factor, which is what Dr. Gawande mentioned, that we've been wrong about our jobs, what our job is in medicine. So we have to um, be confident about the pace of change, uh, be impatient with it, but keep pushing. So that's where I see we're at as far as the public, the government, the societal uh, pressures are and what we have to deal with. Um, now just a, a word or two about where the care partner or the caregiver, those demands are incredible. And I think that's what got me so interested in, in Alzheimer's. Because this is a time in life, when we're in our middle years and later years, where we're meant to be self-reflecting, growing, um, developing into some kind of transformational selves. As Maslow would say, looking at self-actualization, becoming who we are. It's almost impossible to do that when there's so little time for personal growth and well-being. And we know that as a caregiver, if you're stressed, you are going to have much more uh, likelihood of early death and disease than if you're not stressed. So actually, caregivers have an impossible task. And that's why I wrote my second book, because we're saying, you have an impossible job to do, you're going to feel guilty. Oh, and by the way, look back to yourself. It's, that's an impossible time of life, which we need uh, to look at. And we're starting to. So coping skills are needed for <coughs> caregivers and 
those with Alzheimer's, we're not prepared to, to handle the way we're looking at Alzheimer's and um, the care partner having to do so much. In fact, there was just an article that came out uh, this week which looked at providing some coping skills, one of which just by chance is one I'm going to talk to you about tonight, and they tested this coping skill with patients with uh, mild to moderate Alzheimer's, as well as the caregiver, and found a real decrease in depression and anxiety. So we're coming with getting these, these skills out there. So what I wanted to do is talk about some possible, um, not solutions, but approaches that maybe we could consider. And maybe we already have. And but they're just the kinds of things that, that I think are worth looking, worth looking at that, that we can do. Well, we need to push to be better advocates, more advocacy. And age isn't a barrier. It doesn't matter if we're 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or, or 90. It doesn't matter if we have um, diseases or disabilities or cognitive impairment or, or dementia, we can all advocate. And so age doesn't matter a bit. And that makes me think about that the old man who um, uh, had a farm in Florida and he had a, a lovely pond down at the bottom of his farm. And he walked down there in the evening. And one evening he walked down and there were several young women frolicking naked because it was a hot day in Florida. And they said, we're not getting out old man, we're not getting out. He said, I wouldn't even think of asking me to get out. He said, I just came down to feed the alligators. <laughs> <laughs> so age isn't a barrier at all. In, in, in Denmark, for example, they have an excellent um, program for people with Alzheimer's. It's a real community base, lots of support. But in Denmark, one of every six seniors belongs to an uh, advocacy group. One of every six seniors. And that's what brought about a lot of those changes. We have lots of good groups here. We have CART, we have our Alzheimer's societies. Um, we have just our own ability to make a, a noise. And we have a sense of urgency. Now, the second point that I, I wanted to talk about is right here in my heart, heart is the strength of the volunteer network. And you have lots of wonderful volunteers, and, and they're doing lots of wonderful things. But I still think we underappreciate the strength of volunteers. Who better has experience, probably knowledge, commitment, passion, belief, and volunteers. And remember that it was volunteers who built the ark. It was professionals who built the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I became very much aware of this when I worked with the Canadian the Colorectal Cancer Association. There was such a need for people to answer questions from patients. Because colorectal cancer is complicated and, and there's so many decisions to be made. But they didn't have anyone to answer those questions for people all across Canada. And I've heard of a program for breast cancer people in the States where they train volunteers and call them cancer coaches. <coughs> and I thought, well, of course, that's what we need, cancer coaches. We'll just take people who have had colorectal cancer or have it, who are interested, educated, <coughs> passionate, we'll give them a little more training, and they can answer the questions. And that's what we did, and that's what's still going on. Once you take someone who's interested and has some experience, and you give them that little bit of extra training with a few more hours, you have a force to be reckoned with that can take on a far bigger role than oftentimes we let our volunteers do. And certainly countries in Europe that have done a lot with Alzheimer's 
like Holland and and Japan and Germany and and England are using volunteers training and giving them that little bit extra, those few more hours, and then giving them some professional uh, backup, but letting them go and do what they have the ability and the uh, passion to do. So the, the third point is that I think, and this goes along with all the others, is that the supportive community is so essential. And I know that we do a lot with the coffee breaks and bringing knowledge and having great educational <coughs> opportunities for people. But it's essential. So many people with Alzheimer's and their partners say, you know, we feel alone. We don't have as much contact with professionals. And it's true, if you have another kind of disease, you're probably off to the doctor more, or you're getting more, more contact. But if you have a dementia, you tend not to see your healthcare provider that often. Maybe it doesn't have to be a, the provider, but it needs to be a team of people that can go in quickly or easily and, and talk and be there. Maybe Talk about circles of support where each person, each family can document, okay, this is who supports me. My father does this, my friend does this, my, my neighbor does this, my um, professional does that, but they're there. And there's also the possibility of having something, I'm just throwing this out, something like an Alzheimer's disease rapid response team, where if you, all of a sudden you felt as a caregiver or as someone with a disorder, if you felt alone or you couldn't get out to a meeting or a session, you could call. And someone there would be able to quickly assemble one or two people and go out and be there. Because that contact is essential. It goes back to social support and, and the sense of empowering. <clears throat> we know that care is always best given by a team, and a team could certainly be a couple of well-trained volunteers with a backup of a professional, uh, or it could be a member from the society, and the, the possibilities are, are, are there. We know that caregivers underutilize the, the resources in the community, and there's lots of reasons, right? Lack of transportation, they feel there's a stigma, they don't have the time, um, they're homebound, lots of reasons, but we know that they don't or can't utilize the resources which we have. And then the fourth point is to not underestimate the power of, of knowledge. Knowledge is power. But sometimes it's the care partner that doesn't have all the knowledge they would like to have. Sometimes, and this makes me think of the way cancer was treated way back then, we try to protect that family person or the caregiver. So we shield them. We say, you don't need to know about that, or this might be stressful, or, or don't worry about that. But that doesn't work that way anymore at all. You can't rely on the healthcare team. It's far too complicated a world to expect to get all that knowledge. You have to share it with the people who need it because caregivers, care partners, people with the disorder can handle that knowledge. They'll feel freer, they'll feel much more capable in control. Uh, a friend of mine said, she said, I wish there could be a system where there was more sharing tips with other caregivers. We all seem to require information or su suggestions about what works but we often seem to have to work it out ourselves, especially if you can't get out to a meeting. Maybe email this. Maybe everybody who goes to, to some of the cafes and the groups would put their names on an email. And you could just let the caregivers have the list, call, make contact, empower them, give them all that, that knowledge so we don't, we don't, um, we don't shield them. So that's the 
four points that maybe you'll come back to, to briefly. I want to go back now a little bit to the caregiver as soon as I find where we are. And, and just, just talk a little bit about what we can do to help caregivers be more empowered, feel more in control. And so we can go ahead and make some of these giant leaps in how we look at Alzheimer's. There are three stages of caregiving. It's the way I like to look at it. Maybe you're all familiar with this too. But it resonated with me. First is that heroic stage. It's, it's where you and your partner have been diagnosed and you're energized, you feel optimistic, you, you feel you don't need a lot of help, you can go it alone pretty well. Um, and that lasts for a while. And then you go into the ambivalent stage where you suddenly feel emotionally unstable, you're uncertain, you're not sure what the future will be, what it means for you, where you're going to, to go with it. You, you want to commit to a desire to go beyond just coping, just getting through, but aren't sure how to do that. And then the third stage would be something that we call the new normal stage. It's where you realize it's going to never be the way it was. It's going to be a different kind of life. It's a where you look and find balance in your life. There's some resolution of your situation, the good and the bad, there's inspiration. You come to terms with it, with life, but you don't put aside your own goals and aspirations and, and dreams. And of course you can go back and forth in these stages. So in order to help with that, and I think to help with the whole business of public and private, I want to just go over briefly a couple of um, coping skills that work. And I think they would work for caregivers, patients with the disorder, and also for professionals. Because we, as professionals and as, as caregivers and as volunteers, aren't going to be able to do it alone, and we're not going to be able to do it, what's required of us without, without some good solid skills. So the two that I want to talk to you about are mindfulness and ways of thinking. Um, there's a little bit of bad news. That's the but. They work. These, these, t these tools will give you more control. They'll make you happier, healthier. Uh, accomplishing what you want. They're kind of like miracle things. Like it's a promise. But it's always a hitch, right? They're not going to work if you don't practice them. How often have you gone to hear somebody talk and they say, no, this did this. That's, this is going to be very helpful. And you've gone home and thought, great. And you tried it. Nothing happened. So you just give that up. It's not going to help my life. And it's because it hasn't become part of you. You have to practice. And what we know about humans learning anything new, it takes 30 to 60 times of practice of, of repeating something that you want to learn to make a change in the way you look at the world and then for what you do. That's the bad news. I, don't, I think Confucius said this. He may not have said it all. He said some of it. It, but I like it. I hear, I forget. <clears throat> I see, I remember. I do, I understand. I practice, I master. So I want to share with you two of these, these two things. And for some reason I've got mindfulness first. And that's called mindfulness or mindful meditation. Are, are you familiar with, with that? Someone who do it, know about it. All it is is being in the moment. That's all it is. You just don't think about the past or the future. You think about this moment. What that does is that it somehow frees the brain 
to suddenly be able to work in a healthier, more positive um, way that gives us peace of mind and energy and creativity and health. And they've done so much research on it that it's something that just is. <clears throat> All it is is being aware of the moment. As someone said, a lot of people in this room have never probably even had a shower or a bath. You've been in the bathtub or in the shower, but you really weren't, right? You were thinking about tomorrow or the, the meeting or lunch or supper or the problems from yesterday. You weren't in a moment. And what we know is if you can be in the moment, not reacting, just being aware of it, that you will find more energy, more peace of mind. Um, you can practice just with breathing, just with focusing on your breath, just focusing on three breaths. And all you do is put your mind on your breath. And if your mind wanders into whatever, you just bring it back. Just bring it back. That is mindfulness, mindful meditation. It can revolutionize your, your life, your health, and your well-being. But it only works if you practice it, do it, a, few, a couple of times, a few times a day. That's um, mindfulness. What it does do is that it makes your mind become calm and focused, relaxed and alert. It's like a snow globe when the, when the flurries of snow settle and all is calm. It does that to your mind. And when that happens, your mind can function very fully. And how I like to describe it to people is that if this is the spinal cord, and this is the brain that controls our functions, our thinking, our connection to all our, our nerves, and this is the thinking part, our cortex, the thinking, worrying, processing, whatever, the minute that you engage in focusing on the, the moment, it sort of frees this part of the, of the brain that controls health and well-being and allows it to function in a, in a better way. It, it's, it's as simple as, as that. And it's, and it's powerful. So, so it's this, letting go, that's letting go of your thinking thinking. We have about 70,000 thoughts a day that go through our, our minds and they're going fast. Letting go is always easier than holding on if you can let go. And that's how the new stuff will find you. And we know about the brain, right? We've heard about neuroplasticity. We know that the brain can learn different ways. Brain is trainable and that's good. Any questions about that, about mindfulness, mindful meditation, a simple, powerful coping tool for all of us? And the second coping skill that's extraordinarily powerful is the way we think. I put in really, because everyone says, well, what do you mean, the I know how we think? We think, that's, that's how it is. But it isn't exactly like that. This is the way we think. Now, can you tell me if you agree? For most of life, things happen or facts are there that we have little or no control over. Would you agree? We don't have much control over most things that happen. Maybe a little, not much. Whether we're born, um, you know, when we're short or tall or get diseases or, or get fired or crops are bad or, or whatever, we have little or no control over those facts. But for every fact, we immediately have a thought. And that thought can go through our minds in a nanosecond. So you don't even think you've had the thought. But the thought leads to a feeling or an emotion. So what most people do is think, well, this happened, and therefore I feel this way. And we say, uh-uh, it doesn't work like that. 
There was a thought in there. That thought might have gone so fast that you don't even know you had it, but it was there. And if you stop and say, hey, what's the thought that I've got about this situation that's making me feel this way? It'll come to you. The thought will come to you. Does that make sense? That that's how the brain works? It isn't just a fact and then a, an emotion. It's a thought. Now, isn't it interesting? We have no control at all, if, if perhaps a small amount, about the facts in our lives. We have total control over the thoughts. Absolutely total control. And that's where control comes from in life. And it's our thought, it's our feelings, right, that give rise to what we do. If we're angry or enthusiastic or determined or tired, whatever these feelings are, they come from a thought. So the ways we think, we know, can lead to more positive thoughts. Our feelings can make our health better, give us more satisfaction in life, give meaning to life, help us become more resilient, increase social support, you, you name it, all of those things. Um, we even know how people think. And we, this is just a list, I won't go into it, but we tend to think the way we've been taught to think, right? From our parents, our, our <coughs> priests, our whoever, our professors. But lots of times they're, they're in patterns that aren't necessarily helpful to us. And these are the patterns that have been identified. We tend to think in um, all or nothing, um, we generalize, we disqualify the positive, uh, all sorts of things. The one I like a lot is using should too often. If you find you use the word should a lot, I should do this, they should do that, society should be like this, the government should do that, my friend should be like this. If you use that word, sh or I should be doing this better, I should have done that, I should do that a lot. We say you got a shitty outlook on life. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of using the word should, you can put in another. So we won't, I won't go into those. I'm just keeping an eye on, on time. This I like. The greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by changing their minds their thoughts. And the study that I mentioned before that just came out was <coughs> teaching this technique to people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's and having it lower anxiety and lower depression. Isn't, isn't that powerful? And it's a, a low cost intervention. It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take uh, very much cost. But it's had some real impact on people with uh, Alzheimer's. So thoughts are the only thing we really can control, and how hard is it to change our thoughts? Well, it, it turns out it's not so hard at all to do it. Because the wonderful thing is, is our brains that are so incredible are also so naive. You give it the brain a message, it's got it. So just imagine right now, all of us here, we all have a lemon, a big, um, big lemon, a knife, spoon, cut the lemon, squeeze the juice onto your spoon, put it in your mouth, and just suck it back. Just do it in your mind's eye. If you didn't feel anything, take a whole half of the lemon and bite down on it. And just, don't you feel anything? A little more saliva, a little runnier, a little tingling, or a little puckering. The brain, the brain knows there's no lemons in this room, <laughs> right? It knows it reacted to the thought. You don't have to believe the thought. 
You just have to give it to the brain. And that's powerful. So that's a really quick introduction to ways of thinking, which is the, the, the basis of cognitive behavioral training or therapy, which is found to be so effective for caregivers and, and now people with dementia. Anyhow, this is just a summary, a brief summary. These are the things that, that I think are, are good to think about, discuss, disagree with maybe, say, hey, we're already there, but they're just food for thought. It doesn't take a lot to practice those two coping skills or to teach them to caregivers, to people with, with dementia, to professionals, to staff, to volunteers. It is never safe to look into the future with eyes of fear. And when you do, and you remember the, the coping skills, the things we've talked about, All I want you to do is remember the lemon and give yourself the, the, the thought. Take those breaths, be in the moment, and realize everything is, is possible if we, if we push. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>